Brendan Taylor has released an incredible statement about how he was sucked in and ultimately blackmailed by match fixers. You have to admire Taylor's honesty. However, belatedly, even if his hand was slightly forced by being caught in a non-fixing related issue. And you hope that he can overcome his problem with substances and get his life back. This is the last knot. My dad told me to save us. Now, compared to most cricket reporters, I'm in a different situation because I've actually worked on the other side of cricket. I've heard players discuss how a group of girls is an obvious honey trap outside of the, the dressing room and I've had to deal with players who repeatedly put themselves into dangerous positions and also I've been contacted by the anti-corruption unit from the ICC before during their investigations. But perhaps most importantly, I've also been in the meetings that the ACU hosts. The ICC regularly trains players and officials to share them with the latest techniques that the fixers are using so that they can stay one step ahead. The problem really isn't with the education. I'm not saying that they couldn't improve it, but they give clear advice, answer all questions, and use video testimony from players to explain how these things happen. The real problem is how professional sports work and then how cricket work, and the two of them clash very violently. We have a sport where players travel around the world almost endlessly, spending time in hotels, airports, restaurants, out and about, far from home. And then we have a sport that is so easy to fix. In fact, our sport was designed so we could bet on as many things as possible. That's why the laws are the way they are. This is not an accident. And then you have to add in how professional sports work, right? In one of my meetings, a player asked the ACU officer, if someone gives me an iPhone and I report it straight away, can I still keep it? That's a different world than you or I live in. People aren't offering me iPhones, although, you know, feel free to do so. No one has ever given me something of that value for free. Players exist in a world where this is a legitimate question. So many of my friends are players or former cricketers and they get their dinners paid for all the time. They don't see anything wrong with it because it's been that way since they first bowled a scary fastball or could switch hit a six. It's part of their life. And it's part of being a professional athlete. People do give you stuff often to pretend to be your friend, sometimes in exchange for Instagram photos, and then there is the smaller percentage of, you know, nefarious shit. And this is something the ICC have tried to tell players and officials over the years, that there is no such thing as a free meal. But it is actually a free meal. And that's why the players find it so hard to say no, especially early in their career when the money isn't that big. And also then again later in the career, as it starts to dry up, or when they become coaches and the money almost disappears altogether. And Taylor was a late stage player and he streaked the other Zimbabwean was a coach. And there is more linking streak and Taylor than just their nationality and their current predicaments. There is a very good point in this tweet. Zimbabwe and other teams have often not paid their players on time. It's a recurring theme in modern cricket. The ICC does little to ensure that players are actually paid. And it's not just for national duty, as I've said before, Franchise cricket is completely overrun by late payments and sometimes no payments at all. And most times to play in a franchise league, you have to get permission of your board, which is called an NOC, and then you're playing in an overseas league, which is sanctioned by a local board, or if it's a smaller country, maybe the ICC directly. And then when those leagues don't pay, no one fights for your wage. Despite the fact that almost all those leagues have at least one board and usually two boards involved. And this is the players. It gets far worse when you get to the coaches and support staff. And I say this from personal experience, as I have had late payments before, and I'm still owed money from jobs that I know I'll never see. And that doesn't even mention t-shirt sellers and police and kit manufacturers. The amount of people paid late, and I'm talking about six to nine months, is not that uncommon, or not at all, is staggering, especially considering the cricket is a multi-billion dollar sport. And the board, franchise, or league, they just keep chugging forward, you know, completely untouched by the system. And that's because it is their system. The ICC is two groups. First is the administration, which is loosely in charge of their own events and other low level things like anti-corruption, umpires, fines, things like that. That ICC admin is then governed by the major cricket boards, the same ones who don't pay their players or are complicit in their own players not being paid. What Brendan Taylor did was stupid. Whether he thought the deal was going to lead to fixing or not, he put himself in a position to be compromised. And then his issues with substances, well, obviously made it all worse. He should have reported what happened sooner. Although Brendan McCullum waited even longer to report his. The difference may come that Taylor's confession came under duress. But Zimbabwe cricket had not paid Taylor for six months. And his streak was in a similar boat. 
Streak actually tried to get Zimbabwe cricket liquidated to pay its debts because they owed so much money. So it's not really that surprising that two major Zimbabwe cricketers have also pointed to the fact that they're unpaid by their board while also being caught involved in fixing scams. This is not to excuse them either. They did what they did and they will be punished. Streak did what he did and he will be punished. Taylor did what he did and we'll see what happens there. And of course, once this happens, everyone starts to think, well, everything must have been fixed involving these old guys. Like for instance, that time that Brendan Taylor knocked off his own bail. In fact, video of this was sent to me the moment he put out his statement. And as far as I'm aware, the ICC do not believe this was a fixing issue. It was, however, most probably an umpiring error. But Taylor has opened up his career so that everyone's going to look at all those moments now. He streak will not be involved in cricket for a long time, rightfully, and Taylor, we can assume, something similar. And you can argue that they were victims of circumstances, but they're also both grown men who obviously knew better. But what about Zimbabwe cricket or the BPL, IPL, Sri Lankan board, CPL, and so many others who've been a part of non-payments or late wages? My guess is that business will continue as usual for them. Not to mention that cricket will continue to allow sponsors from gambling companies. Now these organizations can actually be really helpful as fixing costs them money. So a relationship between the legal gambling world is actually quite helpful for the ICC and cricket boards. But the juxtaposition of taking money from people gambling on your sport to also people while cricketers are involved in fixing is always a little bit awkward. The truth is that we can't really stop corruption in cricket. Match fixing has a 200 year history in our sport. In 1817, the first man to make two centuries in a game at Lords was William Lambert. Later that same year, I think, he was found guilty of match fixing. And there were rumors about plenty of players, even WG Grace. There is this idea that players were all about the game back then. But in truth, even the most goldenest boy of the golden age of cricket, Victor Trumper, went on strike from the Australian team over payments. Money's always been an issue for cricketers. Why would it not be? It's been an issue for all other humans. And you can educate people as much as you want, but the combination of lifestyle and our sport means that it's probably always going to be there. And the problem with the Brendan Taylor story really is that none of this is surprising. He was a senior player, well-traveled, who wasn't paid enough through cricket's flawed system, and then he took a free meal or in this case, a $15,000 meal, with a bump of cocaine. He had probably done similar things before. The difference is that this free meal was part of a plan to entrap and then blackmail him. The problem really isn't that last dinner. It's all the other freebies that lead up to this. But this wasn't one bad decision. This was a situation he was largely in because of the way that cricket is run and how easy it can be fixed. But it's also something that happened because of all the free dinners he had had up until that point. The only difference with this one for Brendan Taylor was that the last dinner was poisoned. Thank you.